I'm not suggesting by any means that we don't acknowledge our feelings, our emotions, but we don't have to sort of live in them. They don't have to own us. And the, one of the most obvious ways to do that is to take action, which is the motion. You know, so, you know, and I always tell my clients, you need to almost have a game plan around this. And this is way before the pandemic is, you know, have an idea of what the action is that you can take based on the emotion that you have. So if you are feeling sad, what action can you take to make you feel less sad? We are looking forward our way. Hi, I'm Brett, and with me is Carol. Hi, Brett. How are you today? Doing great, doing great. We've got a great episode today. Go right into it. We do, we do. And I am so honored to introduce Aurel Jackson, from the, who is the president of Limitless Growth Strategies. Aurel has over 20 years of executive leadership experience and is recognized for developing and optimizing strategies, delivering high-value solutions, building strategies, Strong relationships. She's served as the System Director of Community Health, Wellness, and Development for one of Central Ohio's largest health providers, and her areas of expertise include executive coaching, diversity and inclusion, leadership development, DISC assessment, career transition coaching, facilitation, strategic planning, and focus groups. Aurel, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. We've uh, been together before, and we really wanted to make sure that uh, we had you on our new podcast program. One of the areas of her work as president of Limitless Growth Strategies is guiding individuals and organizations to successfully maneuver through changes and transitions with the goal to help unleash p- potential, just like the acorn growing into the mighty oak tree. I had to get that in there because I love her logo with the acorn. Um, so I really wanted to talk about that notion of unleashing potential. Arel, we are really excited to get going and have you with us on our new podcast, Looking Forward Our Way. So we're going to get started. We are going through so much uncertainty. Uh, We want to explore the phases we move through to reach emotional well-being and learn how we can creatively stay connected and move forward. Um, You have mentioned the notion of liminality. Uh, Can you give us a, a bit of an overview on what that is and help our listeners through the various stages of crisis transition? Sure. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Carol. So liminality is um, a word that I learned recently, um, but it's been around for a while and it's associated with the study of anthropology and it's really about thresholds. So um, it's about making transitions. So in from an anthropological Anthro- from an anthropology stand- standpoint, this is about uh, maybe like a rite of passage, so going mm-hmm. from right. childhood to adulthood, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. But using it in a contemporary um, framework, we can certainly think about this um, in the situation we're in. So liminality is like the situation of being betwixt and between. Mm-hmm. So we are looking at the past in the rearview mirror. We know that the po- we cannot go back. We have to let it go, and we're standing on the threshold of the future. Now, in other situations, we can look to others who have gone through that rite of passage or who have made that transition, but I think one of the reasons why it seems so stressful now is because we have no guide map. We have no idea what's coming, and so this liminality, this um, ambiguity really is very hard for us to live in for an extended period of time. I don't Mm -hmm. think any of us love ambiguity anyway. Right. But to like have no idea of when it might end is really difficult. And so we, you know, oftentimes when we get into a crisis, we get almost energized. You know, we sort of galvanize our forces. We pull our team together. We sit down with our family and we say, this is a crisis. What's our game plan? And we get going and there's energy around it. And then we get to this place where the energy sort of starts to subside and we get into this liminal space and that we then start to enter, if we're not careful about it, a period of regression where we start to really feel um, in some ways depressed about the situation. We feel lost. The ambiguity is getting to us. I think a lot of us can relate to that. Oh, absolutely. Right. And so then to get to the next phase, which would be recovery, would be kind of looking at how do we harness that energy we had at the beginning 
acknowledging the liminality, acknowledging the ambiguity, and and even acknowledging how difficult it may be moving forward, but sort of making a plan and bringing, you know, a support system around you or even just changing your mindset, which is a lot of what we're going to talk about mm-hmm. moving forward, but getting then back into that place of recovering from the regression so that we can move forward. You know, I will bet that every anthropologist in the country is out there dealing with the issue of liminality during this pandemic, because this is the perfect Mm -hmm. case study Mm -hmm. of being so excited at the beginning, everybody was going to take care of each other and make sure our mm-hmm. old our elders were taken care of. And if, you know, the, the one person who goes to the grocery store for everybody, all of that was happening. And a couple of months into it, and um, we Americans who have a short at- attention span <laughs> kept talking new normal, new normal. And it became a buzzword as opposed to a situation we were still dealing with. And everyone got very tired very quickly Mm -hmm. um so i think this is perfect thank you so much that we're going to get a chance to really look and and Mm -hmm. and move through this and and see how we can help everybody uh continue to um enjoy the pandemic enjoy what it's bringing us as opposed to living in the fear of it Mm -hmm. so wonderful great so um one of the things that um you provided us was an overview of the principles that John Maxwell has put together that really leads us through the steps of dealing with liminality and situations like we're in right now with the pandemic. So let's go ahead and and go through those. And there's there are a lot of steps. We want our listeners to hang there with us and we'll have information on the podcast notes to keep so they can keep track. Um, But so the first one is um, everything worthwhile is uphill. So Maxwell created this vision regarding personal growth journeys. And he describes principles of moving through a crisis and beginning with that notion that everything worthwhile is uphill. Well, we're we're right in the middle of it. So tell us what we're seeing. Right. So, um, you know, I think this is, uh, you're going to hear me say almost with every one of these, this is my favorite. Yes. Um, This is one of my favorites (laughs) um, because I think it is a really good reminder to us that, um, that it's going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. And so um, I know it sounds really glib saying everything worthwhile is uphill, but I think we forget that. I think we're used to living in a world of um, instant gratification. Right. And so, and suddenly that doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, Maxwell, one of Maxwell's favorite sayings is we have downhill habits and our ambitions and our aspirations live uphill. And so we've got to counterbalance the downhill habits. And so what we're really talking about here is bringing intentional thought and and th- and the process of thinking, managing your mindset to acknowledge this is a journey, first of all, and it's an uphill journey. And this journey that we're going through right now is a, a particularly steep hill. Mm-hmm. And I think when, you know, so, you know, I, I'm a great optimist. So some people will say to me, well, that doesn't sound optimistic, Aurel. And I was like, yeah, but... I think if you want to be a successful optimist, you have to be a realistic optimist. Right. So I keep my view at the top of the hill, knowing that when I get there, it'll be worthwhile. But if I don't acknowledge that it's going to be difficult climbing that hill, it can be very easy for me to let go and say, like, this isn't going. This this is too hard. And I, I'm not kidding you. I don't feel like that every day. <laughs> there have been a lot of days where. I've acknowledged how steep the hill is, but but sort of hanging on to the, the the knowledge that my dreams and aspirations live at the top of the hill, and I have got to, if I want to get there, I've got to make the journey, and it's not always going to be easy. And it's, it's I think, the acknowledgement of the fact that it's going to be a challenge. It doesn't make it easier, but it makes it, um, it, makes it easier for you to, to mentally manage the process. Right. A friend of mine mentioned that he thought the generation of children in school now are going to actually be so much better off at the end of this new normal Mm -hmm. um, because they've met a challenge. Mm -hmm. And for years, our young folks have never had to meet a challenge because somebody was always making it okay for them. And so... What a great um, ending or Mm -hmm. a great um, uh, 
product mm-hmm. of this journey that mm-hmm. we're going on is that it actually could make make us better right. people overall. Mm-hmm. So wonderful. Yeah. The next is there is always an answer. Well, it seems that whenever we meet a challenge or crisis, we react. We may panic or become stymied, or we think clearly through the situation to a conclusion. How is our thought process leading us to or maybe away from a solution? Okay. So this is definitely my favorite one. There you go. <laughs> okay. There's no, no we've got that down. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, to me, this is... Um, if you can have this mindset, if you can approach a situation, a crisis, a problem from the perspective of there is always an answer, it it frees you up to to think about it differently. It frees you from – it doesn't make the problem smaller, but it makes you believe in yourself. It makes you rely on uh, – you know, know that you might not have the answer, but that – you, that there is an answer, and I, you know, I always think about a mentor that I had, who, when I first met him, um, he said to me, "I just want you to know, I, I firmly believe there is always an answer. So no matter what happens, we'll get through it." And it was one of the most freeing things mm-hmm. I'd ever heard. And you know, when we did have any sort of problem come up. It, it sort of t- took so much of the stress away and it allowed us space to think clearly mm-hmm. and creatively and to be solution focused as a be- as opposed to being problem focused. Right. And I think that's just a huge gift to give ourselves, to give ourselves the space to pause and say, you know what, this does seem like the wheels are falling off the bus, but... I know that there's always an answer. There's always a solution. So whether you're doing leading yourself, whether you're leading your family, um, but imagine bringing this to a team that you lead. That I mean, what a gift for a leader to give to a team to approach everything from the perspective of there's always an answer. So I think when we can start to like really train our minds to make that our default position, so instead of immediately reacting and thinking, oh, my goodness, what is going to happen? Mm-hmm. It's more like, oh, my goodness, like, huh, breathe. Okay, now there's an, on- there's an answer. We just have to find it. I think what a gift for a leader to give a team. It, it really is telling the team that, there is an answer, mm-hmm. and therefore, what the process that we're going to go through is going to lead again to a positive product, right? As opposed to throwing your hands up and saying, "Oh my gosh, now you know the, the, it's like um, Chicken Little, um, mm-hmm. the world, you know, yeah. the world's coming to the an end." Is falling. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I thought of one situation that I've always been amazed, and this this is perfect. People who are critically ill, mm-hmm. and they have that positive energy and that notion of as long as there are options answers as long as there are options i'm gangbusters in this life Mm -hmm. and and you really wonder where that energy comes from and it this is yeah where we're going good okay all right so let's keep moving on here to the next step allow adversity to help you discover who you are So, you know, we're not always comfortable with change, and we often prefer to stay in our own known world. How can these situations allow us to expand ourselves? So I think, you know, certainly in the crisis, we've seen some businesses fail, Mm -hmm. and we've seen some businesses pivot very quickly and become wildly successful. And I think this sort of points a little bit to that, in that, you know, when you actually, again, using the the mindset before about there's always an answer when you have that bring that kind of thinking to a situation it allows you to be creative and to sort of see where can I use my strengths and how can my strengths um, actually make me make me shine you know how do I actually take from this situation um, you know and and show who I really am and bring that to mm-hmm. to my family, to the world, to my community. So, you know, I think, you know, a, a lot of us, um, we're paralyzed by this type of um, adverse, situ- adverse situation. But when we are, we, we allow ourselves to, to pause, to think creatively about it, we may discover a whole new side of ourselves, very right. much in the way that some businesses looked at the situation, and change. And some, for some of them, changed very dramatically 
to respond right. and to come up with a solution. And so looking at, you know, they became what was needed in the adversity, time of adversity. And that's, I think, you know, what we could also do is like, what do we need to become mm-hmm. using our natural gifts and talents and our skill sets and our expertise that we've gained along the way? How do we yeah. use that to become what is needed? That pause is almost like opening up the funnel and suddenly all that creativity mm-hmm. can actually happen and come through. Right. When we throw up our hands and panic, mm-hmm. it closes that down mm-hmm. and keeps us from really thinking up new ideas. Mm-hmm. Right. I, it leads us to the next one, I think, perfectly, develop a positive life stance. Uh, I, I've always thought about that. When you have those negative thoughts, that's all that allows us mm-hmm. to come in. Mm-hmm. So develop a positive life stance. I mean, we all realize that attitude can lead mm-hmm. us astray one right. way or the other. What emotional level should we be trying to achieve when we're moving through a crisis? Um, so I think we need to, um, again, I think the pause is probably the biggest thing. But but I think, you know, this is not about um, pretending everything is okay. This is about, in many ways, about um, reaching deep inside and realizing what you what you have, both emotionally, emotionally, um, intellectually physically you know what what are the gifts and talents that you have what are the the tools the the resources that you have and acknowledging what you have instead of focusing on what you don't have so this is not like a pollyanna type of situation mm-hmm. of just trying to pretend everything is okay this is a like a taking a, a good long realistic look at yourself and your circumstances and then looking for what is good and focusing on that you know we know that where your focus goes, your energy flows. And so if you can begin to focus on the positive um, instead of on the negative, you begin to see possibilities again. You know, I think what's so wonderful about all of these steps is they are appropriate in the middle of a pandemic. Mm-hmm. And they're also appropriate for whatever the little tiny crisis is at exactly. home that day mm-hmm. um it, it it these are all positive steps right. that we can take to just keep moving through our life mm-hmm. in a a fashion that is good for us right so so what you just mentioned though feeds right back into the next um step and that's feed your faith starve your fears um we see so much negativity today mm-hmm. everything is a huge issue and we are focusing on Um, sort of minding each other's business in a negative way as opposed to just moving ourselves forward in a Mm -hmm. positive way. Um, So how is that negative impact affecting all of us? Right. So first of all, I just want to clarify that the feed your faith, if you want it to mean your, you know, your religious faith, so let's call that faith with a capital F, you can certainly interpret it that, but like that. But um, this also applies to faith in yourself, the confidence and the knowledge that you will be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think maybe the best way to explain this is, you know, I think we've all heard the, the story about um, the two wolves that live in us and the one is love mm-hmm. and the one is fear and, you know, which one wins? It's the one that you feed, mm-hmm. right? So you feed the fear, the wolf that's filled with fear, he's going to win. You feed the wolf that's filled with love and he's going to win or she's going to win, whichever kind of wolf you've got. Um, but but it's, you know, I think this is important for us to, again, it sort of really goes to that, you know, where your focus goes, your energy flows. So, you know, if you focus on the negative, that becomes elevated, that, that takes up all of your creative space, all of the space where you could be thinking about solutions, where you could be thinking differently. And so, you know, I think it is, this is a. Cha- this sounds really easy, but in the world we live in, where we're saturated with information, mm-hmm. right, um, and a lot of the information is negative, yes, or can create a sense of negativity. We have to, I think, take responsibility for what we listen to, what we read, what we look at, who we listen to, um, and choose wisely, and decide whether we're going to feed the fear or whether we're going to feed the positive side right um and and that takes self-discipline 
it, um, you know, I'm not suggesting anybody sort of puts their head in the sand and hides away from the situation, but to, you know, spend your time wisely, spend your energy wisely on things that are going to be um, helpful for you, that are going to help you move forward, and instead of dwelling on the things that um, that really not, that are that are negative, that are not going to really get you any further, except make you feel worse. Right. You know, so. Well, and as you mentioned earlier, this isn't Pollyanna. We're not mm-hmm. ignoring issues. Mm-hmm. We're taking off the rose-colored glasses mm-hmm. and seeing things for truly what they are. But again, you using our own energy to make it to make us better, mm-hmm. as opposed to miring ourselves down with mm-hmm. all that negative, woe is me, how are we going right. to get out of this? Right. So, And I think particularly, you know, this is really important for us as individuals, but this is important for us as families mm-hmm. and as leaders, if you're leading a team or, or even just with colleagues at work, you know, understanding that you have the, the ability or the power to influence people. And, you know, if you are in a group that is sort of looking, feeling very negative, Use your influence, use your creativity um, to help them to shift the way that they are viewing things, to look at it maybe a different way and to sort of shift them towards that more of a solution-focused um, frame of reference mm-hmm. as opposed to dwelling just in the negative. And I think we do, we, we need to do that more for each other so that we, you know, when we need it, somebody will help us out. True. Because it's Very hard to true. keep this up 100% of the time. Sure, mm. sure, absolutely. But but there have been some some um, individuals, and I want to say probably like Hollywood stars, mm-hmm. who have been out there trying to um, keep people positive, getting mm-hmm. interviewed, and, and, and a lot of social media. Mm-hmm. But, but a, a lot of them have said, I want to get through this process and look at my kids and say, we did this together as a family. We did this in a positive way. We're better because of we did Mm -hmm. whatever, you know. And and I think that really um, says a lot to those who have been trying to keep us on the right track during this pandemic. So, okay. Well, next is realize that motions influence emotions. So our conversations today pretty different than in the past. Our emotions are high, (laughs) often paralyzing. Um, We're striving to be positive in our attitude and thoughts, but there is just so much pressure weighing us down. How do we keep a positive path? So this is all about taking action. So, you know, I'm not suggesting by any means that we don't acknowledge our feelings, our emotions, but we don't have to sort of live in them. They don't have to own us. And the, one of the most obvious ways to do that is to take action, which is the motion. You know, so, you know, and I always tell my clients, you need to almost have a game plan around this. And this is way before the pandemic is, you know, have an idea of what the action is that you can take based on the emotion that you have. So if you are feeling sad, what action can you take to make you feel less sad because as soon as you take action you start to um, limit the power that the emotion has over you oh okay you know so if you know it's sort of like if you are feeling um, you know you're having a bad day you're feeling kind of blue and you decide to go for a walk right that actually even from a biochemistry perspective actually changes some of the things going on in your brain to make you feel better but Mm -hmm. it's you taking the action that helps you to feel better i mean you could choose to lie on the sofa and say i'm so so blue i'm like almost magenta (laughs) now it's like really i'm having such a bad day um and you then you could say well now i'm going to feel better but you know what it's really hard to just from an emotional perspective change your mind, right? Right. But if you actually sort of break the cycle of just dwelling in the emotion and take an action. So, you know, again, as I say to my clients, have a game plan. Like if you are having a, you know, if you have a really stressful day at work and you feel like you're on the point of, you know, snapping at somebody, can you take a five-minute walk around the building? Mm -hmm. Can you go, um, can you, do some push-ups or something, you know, whatever. Do something. Or can you call a friend? Um, 
And oftentimes with my clients, I actually help them with their schedules that if they have a particularly contentious meeting coming up, to actually schedule time before and after. So before to take literally a five-minute walk or do a five-minute meditation. And then at the end of it, to take like a 15-minute decompression walk or we'll schedule a phone call so that they can adequately deal with their emotion. But they're taking an action. And I think that's the important thing is, is, is realizing that taking an action, so the motion then begins to influence the emotion. I think we, we always think that our emotions have all this power over us and they influence everything. Well, they can if we let them. But if we actually break that um, flow, we can actually use the actions that we take, the motions, to influence our emotions. So I think it's, again, it's that willingness to take responsibility to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And what have you got to lose by trying? Right. Right. Absolutely nothing. Maybe you got five minutes of fresh air. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. I'm I'm sitting here trying to think, okay, what what motion can I take when I get mad at the driver next to me who's (laughs) texting or the driver in front of me who's texting and slowing down on the freeway? I typically go into another lane, so when their accident occurs, I'm out. (laughs) There's the action. Or you could decide that you're going to start singing. Or, you know, I mean, it could be literally something that, you know, so it's not dismissing the fact that you're having that emotion, but Mm -hmm. it's sort of saying, I'm not, I don't want to dwell there. You know, and I, I often like to remind people that, you know, the physiological things that happen to your body when you are stressed are exactly the same as when you're excited. Really? Okay. So your palms get sweaty, Mm -hmm. your heart beats um, faster, Um, all those same feelings of anxiety, the physiological, the feelings, the manifestation of those feelings, the same as when you get really excited. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's really what we begin to call those symptoms or those manifestations right right so if you can i mean i know a lot of people who do public speaking they they use that trick of um you know they may feel anxious they're having all those you know physiological signs of anxiety and Mm -hmm. i'm not i'm here i'm not talking about like serious anxiety that needs medication i'm all for you know if you need help you need to get it but if you're just sort of preparing for a speech or something like and you you feel that sort of all the butterflies in your stomach right it's exactly the same as when you're excited. So what if you actually said to yourself, I'm so excited about giving this presentation that I've got butterflies in my stomach. Right, right. Uh, you know, that I guess I had my own motion. Whenever I would give a speech, when I was the director mm-hmm. of the agency, um, if I just stood up there at the front of the room and looked at all these people sitting there, I'd start getting nervous. If I started talking to them, I would get excited Mm -hmm. and really look forward to the opportunity to talk to this group. And they, in turn, were feeling better because they it was like they were getting to know me right. and I wasn't just somebody lecturing and you know a talking head in mm-hmm. front of them. Aurel, thank you for your assistance in guiding us through at least the first six steps in this episode, um, the process and, and supporting our listeners in their quest for some personal growth. Um, let our listeners know how they can contact you and discover more on the principles of John Maxwell. Sure, Brett and Carol, thank you very much. Um, you can reach me at Aurel, that's O-R-E-L-L-E, at LimitlessGrowthStrategies.com. And my website is LimitlessGrowthStrategies.com, and you can find all sorts of information there. Great. And then part two of this of this two-part episode of, of, of working and talking with you will be coming out very soon. Thank you. Thank you for coming and joining us today.